you mentioned that some of the tow trucks uh, companies refused to tow vehicles that were associated with the convoy, or they were not um, they were not willing to tow. What's your understanding of why they were refusing to tow? Well, there are several reasons. The first was uh, their own safety. Um, I think they felt that trying to tow a vehicle uh, without the site being secured in amongst uh, pro protesters. You could imagine, um, you know, it could be quite conflictual when you're trying to take someone's truck and people are still around the truck. So they were concerned about that. They were concerned about the damage potentially to their own vehicle should things get out of hand and it's a cost to their uh, business. Some are concerned that they do business with, uh, with truckers and trucking companies and that this would damage them uh, reputationally and they would lose business. Um, some were um, um, uh, sympathizers or supported the protests and didn't feel that they were going to offer their services to do it. Those were generally um, the reasons. My last question relates to a proposition that Council for the Government of Canada put to you in terms of forcing the, uh, enforcing the City of Ottawa's injunction. And the suggestion was that enforcement of the injunction came in the days after the invocation of the Emergencies Act. Um, and my question to you is, was the City's injunction ever used as a measure? Are you aware? No. It wasn't used as a measure. We set forth um, a framework that would have them go into a smaller perimeter. I consulted with Mr. Ayotte. I think I, rem I remember him saying that there was room for, you know, a signific significant number of large trucks as long as they parked in a more compact fashion in that broad, broad perimeter of Elgin, Wellington, and west of that. Um, and obviously, we're in the middle of the pandemic. Most of those buildings were empty at that point in time. We expected that if there were significant operational concerns, the city would have raised that with us in the last stretch of this, those discussions in the last uh, 48 hours as the city was liaising with OPS and other uh, police forces. Um, and so, no, there was no explicit, um, it wasn't like a, the handshake was not predicated on every single truck will, will go to Wellington, because then if they'd move trucks to Bankley Kill or um, or aren't prior, then it would have been seen as being outside of the agreement. We tried to not get too bogged down in that. Um, sorry, you said um, you would have expected that the city would have raised concerns. I, I'm assuming you meant OPS. No, um, because we had no uh, direct dealings with OPS on uh, the scope and the nature of this goodwill arrangement to try to get more trucks outside of the uh, residential precincts. Our liaison, as it is normally, um, well, normally, sorry, our liaison on almost every single uh, city matter is through the city manager's office. And the city manager liaises with, uh, you know, various groups the, uh, uh, that, that they have um, a role in on which we don't sit. What exactly was being discussed in those, those three days? I think it was February 10th to February 12th, what, what was being negotiated? As you know, we're already 10 days into the crisis um, uh, with horns blaring and, you know, heavy trucks um, spewing diesel into uh, a number of residential streets um, in the core at Rideau and Sussex, um, at Coventry and Overbrook Forbes. Um, our goal from the get-go was to get a sense of their willingness to recognize through Mr. French that they were hurting local communities. Um, and if there was no agreement on that notion, then there was nothing to discuss. Um, we wanted to uh, you know, get to a point very, very quickly of understanding of whether or not he could get the key organizers to recognize that they never intended to hurt um, you know, ordinary people in residential districts. And that became apparent quite quickly in our first few discussions. Um, and we, you know, we laid out a couple of ideas. Some of them had come directly from the PLT team. Because again, as, as you would know, and as I mentioned to you earlier, I cannot recall us ever being involved in a discussion with a group of demonstrators directly. It would not happen. Um, and so we, you know, we sought to establish some parameters and they included, um, you know, a sense from them of their willingness to remove a large number of um, trucks from the residential district and we set out a number, 75 percent, uh, below which we felt we would not be providing any uh, relief to the re residents who were um, under essentially, you know, what they viewed as siege and what we concurred with as being a 
a siege of their day-to-day -day life. Um, so it had to be a big number. Uh, we wanted to see rapid progress on the removal of trucks because we would find out very, very quickly if, um, if this was a stunt or if it was a bluff to try to you know, gain more time. Or, and we found out that it wasn't a stunt. We believe that, um, sorry, we set out those parameters of roughly 75% rapid movement um, towards uh, you know, removing the trucks from the residential district. Um, and they, we rapidly came to uh, you know, uh, an understanding in principle. I wrote something up. I sent it to Dean, uh, which was going to be the mayor's um, opening position around this is what we need um, for us to have a dialogue and to commit to a potential meeting, a listening meeting with uh, Mayor Watson. Our goal from the get-go was to get a sense of their willingness to recognize through Mr. French that they were hurting local communities. Um, and if there was no agreement on that notion, then there was nothing to discuss. Um, we wanted to, uh, you know, get to a point very, very quickly of understanding of whether or not he could get the key organizers to recognize that they never intended to hurt, um, you know, ordinary people in residential districts. And that became apparent quite quickly in our first few discussions. And so we, you know, we sought to establish some parameters and they included um, you know, a sense from them of their willingness to remove a large number of um, trucks from the residential district. And we set out a number, 75%, uh, below which we felt we would not be providing any uh, relief to the residents who were um, under essentially, you know, what they viewed as siege and what we concurred with as being a, a siege of their day-to-day -day life. Um, so it had to be a big number. Uh, we wanted to see rapid progress on the removal of trucks because we would find out very, very quickly if, um, if this was a stunt or if it was a bluff to try to, you know, gain more time or, and we found out that it wasn't a stunt. Do you know why the, the Parliamentary Protective Service was trying to reach the mayor's office? Yes. And, and what reason is that? They wanted to share their concerns around, um, uh, the fact that they did not like the idea of having seeing more trucks move into the Wellington precinct. Um, and they further shared the information that there could be uh, theoretically a bomb in one of the trucks. We expect uh, to hear from Mr. Drummond that the OPS put an end to the movement of vehicles to Wellington um, for two reasons. One, because there was no more room on Wellington and two, because the Emergencies Act was invoked and the police needed time to consider the emergencies orders. Did you hear, so starting with the first, um, had you heard anything about there being, a, you know, no more room on Wellington? No. Had you heard to the contrary that there was still room on Wellington? No, but I had heard from city staff that there was enough, you know, paraphernalia and hot tubs and things that could be moved and displaced, that there was enough room to move a large number of trucks into the precinct. Okay. That was their analysis, and maybe it, you know, if they made a mistake, I don't know. We, we trusted their judgment that there was significant room. And had you heard anything about the movement of trucks being stopped because of the invocation of the Emergencies Act on the 14th? We read about it. Um, we speculated, like, like others, that that might have been a significant driver of that uh, uh, but it was just speculation. Yes. So those are the letters dated February 7th, correct? correct? And so your understanding is that prior to that date, there had been requests being made by the OPS for additional resources. That's what was conveyed to me. And I think you can see that in some of the exchanges between myself and, and Chair Deans, but I, I, I can't remember exactly where in those exchanges. Do you know how long those resource requests had been ongoing? I don't. Okay. And did she provide to you an explanation for why those requests not. have been unsuccessful? She did not. But it was felt at that time that it was no longer sufficient to be making those requests at, at the police to police level and that it we, had to be escalated. I have no, we cannot ascertain that the request when made, was made police to police. We were only told that the OPS was unsuccessful in getting additional, uh, you know, people and bodies um, 
provided to the, the, joint, the, the tripartite effort by the other two agencies. And the numbers that we were seeing, uh, that were referred to in previous exchanges, seemed to corroborate the fact that no significant additional resources were coming to the effort in the first 10 days of the crisis. Regard, you, you want to speak regarding Ottawa's request for additional uh, enforcement support, as we see there. Um, why did you feel it was necessary at that time, so this was two days after making the request, uh, to engage directly with the PMO? Uh, two things were happening. Uh, the discrepancy in the numbers being provided to OPS relative to the numbers that OPS was seeing on the ground um, and what we felt uh, to be friendly fire coming from, you know, various political voices federally saying it's up to the city to step up and do their job, um, roughly, which we can find that text if you want. But, um, you know, I wanted to convey to um, the Prime Minister's office that we needed their help. Um, the numbers were inconsistent. What we wanted them to know that, that we were, we were being told about the numbers um, uh, was inconsistent. Um, and, uh, and I conveyed that, and uh, I believe that there was a change in tone, you know, roughly the next day. I think maybe someone realized this will have to be a team effort. Um, we need them. It's clear that we need them to help um, end the insurgency and, and the demonstration. And, uh, and I guess everyone came around to the conclusion that it would be better to, to try to take a collaborative approach and, um, and maybe try to reduce some of the finger pointing. You have this many, we have this many, we think you have this many, no, we think you, you're only giving us this many. And then people being out there saying, we think the city is going to be able to end it by, by themselves. They have the authority and the capacity to do it. You had no plan in that period, 8 to 13th. No plan was possible, in your view, without collaboration, and collaboration was late in coming. Is that a fair summary? It's a very, very, very summary, and may I respectfully add that I believe that, uh, you know, there's a lot of armchair quarterbacking, and in hindsight, I'll give one example. A member of council was tweeting, no mass arrests. That was at the start. Uh, the, the chief of police was telling us um, the charter rights. He told the mayor, and the mayor has no authority to overrule the chief of police on op police operations. He told the mayor, the charter uh, dictates that we allow this demonstration. Clearly, we have learned all, everyone, the city, OPS, our partners have learned that, that the world of policing has changed. And uh, this ended up being almost an immovable armada. It wasn't just individual trucks coming to Ottawa. It was the collective potential impact of all of those trucks, you know, in, a, in the parliamentary precinct bleeding into the residential district that, you know, made it so uh, complex and unprecedented. We've rented a giant Airbnb right next to the Trucker Commission of Inquiry for the whole six weeks. We are going to staff it with Rebel News journalists. We're taking shifts. 15 of our reporters are going to cycle through this Ottawa studio, and we are going to cover the Trucker Commission of Inquiry as carefully and comprehensively as we cover the convoy itself. But I need your help. Please go to truckercommission.com to help me cover the extraordinary costs of this important journalistic mission. Thank you.